one of you an opportunity to introduce yourself, talk about what you've worked on in the past legislative session, and what ideas you have moving forward and what you will be working on. Okay. Joyce San Buenaventura State Representative, District of Puna. Um, yeah, I was in the, I as well as Senator Espero was in the original working group for the conference committee that first legalized the medical marijuana dispensaries and both of us are still in the working group to keep tweaking that. And yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I had the opportunity to be the the lead senator in 2015 when we passed the dispensary bill. Um, if any of you know anything about that bill, uh, the bill died. It died in session at 5 o'clock. Uh, we had one more hour, 6 o'clock. But because the chair of the House and the Senate chair were at odds, and I guess somebody got mad, she took a thing, her balance. She said at 5 o'clock, boom! We're done. It's over. And the bill died. So that was when uh, Senator Green was the chair. We had a plan to resurrect it. I worked with uh, Senator Kim, uh, Senator, Senator uh, Donovan Delacruz. And we basically had to show the Speaker of the House that uh, we were serious. We wanted to bring the bill back alive and pass it out and then get the House to support it. And that's what happened on that. That's why we have dispensaries today. And you know, we're, we're making baby steps, but you know, the best is yet to come, and we'll leave it at that for now. Okay. And um, I just want to add in a little bit because sure. I was the only other representative in that conference, and I was in the inner sort of inner circle in the state house as to why that bill originally died. We were unhappy with the Senate chair's um, requirements. If those of you who had followed it um, knew how extraordinarily difficult it would have been for new dispensaries to have started had we gone on with the Senate chair's um, recommendations. So we allowed it to die, and we're glad that the Senate reorganized in two hours, and we resurrected the, and <coughs> I, that was the first time I was a first term, I was a freshman. For, for a freshman to be in such a new, innovative law and to be part of inner workings, I was privileged to be part of that. But that was the first time I knew you could resurrect a bill. You know, at 8 o'clock at night, however, the people who were part of, who were following it, knew that 8 o'clock at night, they were right there at the conference committee. Normally, the state capitol would have been blacked out, would have been dark, all lights would have been closed, but the people who were following the bill knew something, because at 8 o'clock at night, boom, the lights were on, and all of a sudden, we were all back there. Of course, Senator Espera, we were, and um, as well as um, Representative Bellotti and myself, and we're working hard to make sure that it passed, and sure enough, it did at 8 o'clock at night after it got resurrected. And to, uh, to, to Josh Green's credit, he was the lead chair, so he got it to that point, to his credit, and I was the second lead chair. And so we worked together to get it to that point. But once it died, um, I took over, and, and hopefully, like they say, the rest is history. So yes. uh, that's where we are now. And we like, yeah, we look, look forward to this discussion about what the future is going to bring, because it's going to bring some some fabulous things. Thank you. I want yes. to give Russell the opportunity. Yes, yes. To yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Russell Ruderman. I'm state senator from Pune and Kau districts. Uh, you know, besides uh, local district concerns, I've, I've worked on things like local food and uh, good government. And relating to the cannabis issue, I have for several years introduced a bill, which I'll introduce again this year, perhaps will be more reception this year, a bill that would allow counties to regulate cannabis. Mm -hmm. Because as, as we all have seen, uh, not just through the legislative session, but through a recent poll, it seems the will statewide is not there for legalizing recreational cannabis. However, if the counties were allowed to decide, I have no doubt in my mind that the Big Island, and actually all three of the outer counties, would choose to legalize it. So that's a way we can experiment with the future without you know, upsetting the conservative folks uh, that don't want this to happen. I don't think it'll 
proceed, but I think it's the logical answer, and I would love to have support for that proposal. Um, the, I will also be introducing a bill to uh, legalize cannabis, which also won't go anywhere. I was not invited <laughs> to be on the, uh, the working group, which I appreciate the work of both of my colleagues on that. Uh, I have more medical marijuana patients in my district than any other district in the state, so it's a big concern to me as well as to my constituents. Another relevant bill that I'll be working on is uh, a, a, a citizen's initiative bill. Right, right now we have a county level initiative which, for example, 15 years ago or so pr produced the lowest level enforcement. Uh, we, we easily passed that 15 years ago. So you can pass county level referendum but not state. So I will be introducing a bill to allow state referendum because many states that have legalized cannabis as well as past fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage, which is another big push for me, and stuff like that, or death with dignity, things that our legislature is, is too timid to pass, and the same thing has been true in other states. Many of these issues have been passed through a citizens' initiative. So it's my thought that since our, our electorate is actually more progressive than our legislature, can we the people please pass a couple <coughs> of laws? And I hope you'll support that too. Thank you. Yeah, just to explain what that is, a, a citizen's initiative currently at the county level, what that means is we can, as a citizen, we can get something on the ballot for people to directly vote on that becomes law. So that means that the citizens themselves are acting as the legislature and it's a reflection of the direct will of the people and their interaction with creating law. And so what Russell is saying is that we have that at the county level right now and that's how we pass the lowest law enforcement of cannabis initiative and also the... 2% for open yeah, the, space. Yeah, the 2% the the open space. So the 2% of all of our taxes now goes to preserving open space for public use. And so we don't have that at the state level right now for things that the state has jurisdiction over, which is cannabis. The courts ruled that at the county level, we currently don't have jurisdiction as just at our own island and county. So that's why we need to move it to the state. And so I think what Russell's working on here is twofold in that we need to work on getting authority at the state level and a, a clearer line of direct will with voters and giving the authority to the counties to regulate ourselves and legalize ourselves if, if that is the wishes of this county. So I'm in the Judiciary Committee in the State House where we look at bills like Russell's about the initiative and um, in fact I had submitted I think last year introduced a similar um, a similar measure, and, and, I, and, and I agree with Russell completely. I believe, especially with what happened with the Open Skies Initiative here in the Big Island, I think if the Big Island was given an opportunity, you know, we would, we would make it far less strenuous as that, that the state requires. Um, but let me just tell you the headwinds, okay? Like, I'm, like I'm in favor of the concept. Um, if we put it in the state, the reason it didn't pass, what my measure was is slightly different from what um, Russell is going to introduce. I, I don't know what you're actually going to introduce, but I suspect it's going to be. Because mine was um, to just do a poll to see what the voter sentiment was. Because I thought that would have a higher chance of passage than a direct initiative. Because if we did a direct initiative, it would be similar to like Colorado which would mean that the state constitution would actually be changed, okay? And I knew every time when you do a constitutional amendment, they, there is going to be strong headwinds. That's the reason when I submitted my, my bill, introduced my bill last term, it was just a polling as to what the voters are going to decide. And that way at least we and the legislator know, you know, what the voters want. Um, well, I, I don't want to go against what Russell is pushing because I agree with it. I'm just letting know, know what the headwinds are and let's see what happens. Um, secondly, I also introduced a bill, um, 2016 I believe, to legalize small amounts of marijuana because I thought 
that with the 2017 session coming in, I, I believe for 2017, we didn't have enough monies for the state budget. And anyone who, is, who, has, who has submitted grants and aid know how many of those were denied because we just didn't have the money. So I thought there would be this hunger for money, in the state capital, that they could see the monies that would be brought in. Uh, the, the state house, not the state senate, is far more conservative regarding that. And so we didn't pass it. What we did do, which was I th thought the most progressive, and to me it is a step in the right direction, was they did pass my bill, which, was, which decriminalized drug paraphernalia. Okay, those of you who ever got arrested, I mean, we're the first one in the entire country to decriminalize drug paraphernalia. Okay, so it, we were first the most strictest in the country because we actually have a class C felony. Other states had only a misdemeanor, which was, seemed comparable, especially when it was marijuana. I mean, why do you have, you know, bombs being treated as a class C felony versus, um, you know, marijuana, which the amount could be as small as a petty misdemeanor. It didn't make sense, you know. And in fact, if you did any criminal defense, which is what I did, it gave the prosecutor too much leverage, you know, to basically make you deal out to a felony, which was, to me, very onerous. And in fact, when I told people in, the, in other conferences about what I did, the um, people who were involved with rehabilitating or, un or employment really applauded me for it because they, found, they said anybody with a felony, and this was a class C felony, the employers don't look beyond as to why you got the felony. Mm -hmm. As soon as you got a felony, it was a black mark, and they, could, they had the most difficult time getting these people jobs. And so to me, that was a step in the right direction. I know we, it's baby steps, but at least it's a step in the right direction. And so um, I'm going to lead on to, to, to Will and, um, and Russell. But we are working on one of the things in my subcommittee of this medical marijuana dispensaries. 2018, we're gonna start issuing new dispensary licenses again. So those who have applications, get your applications together again. So as of 2018, we're gonna open it up again. Um, we are going to try to um, um, normalize as far as transportation of, of marijuana. I mean, the lawyer in me uh, uh, and people who already are involved in it already know that they cannot, if you have, your blue card, they cannot leak. Um, the Hawaii Supreme Court has thrown out convictions, right, if you have your blue card and you have personal amounts, not huge amounts, but personal amounts, they can, um, the convictions don't stand as far as inter-island, okay? Although there's a question as if the DEA gets you, because still, it's still a federal crime. But state-wise, um, the Hawaii Supreme Court has thrown that out. But um, we're, st we're going to try to at least normalize transportation as far as, also as, far as um, testing. Because all the labs right now are not on the Big Island, right? They're somewhere else. So small amounts in to, um, to normalize that. We're also going to um, increase conditions within which you can get a medical marijuana license um, certificate. And as far as... We're looking towards, and I think we're getting huge headwinds on this, to protect from discrimination by landlords and employers. And we're looking to see as to whether or not we can get insurance coverage of, um, for, because it's medicinal. Okay, I think we're gonna get headwinds on that because of Jeff Sessions coming out saying that he's gonna crack down on a lot of um, questionable um, <coughs> marijuana initiatives. But, doesn't hurt to try, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to know what happened to our Peaceful Sky Initiative, which we did pass in 2008 successfully. I've yeah. been away, so some things might have happened uh, while I was off island for a few years. Do we need a Peaceful Sky 2.0 for this next election cycle in the county? Okay, so the circuit court judge refused to enforce the Peaceful Sky Initiative and was backed up by the Hawaii Supreme Court. That's the reason why um, Russell's um, potential introduction of a bill allowing for the counties to at least regulate may, um, hopefully, if we get some traction on that, 
that to me would be the peaceful sky 2.0 is if we could have some form of what um, Russell's um, bill is going to be to allow more county control. Yeah, well, I, I want to focus some energy this coming year in the election cycle, so instead of to the county, then I'll do it to, to support you, Russell. Yeah, and, and just to give you some background information, in fact, um, Mike Ruggles is the one that sued the counties for not enforcing the Peaceful Sky Alliance initiative that was voted on by the people. More people voted for this initiative than voted for mayor. Mm -hmm. And the Hawaii Police Department would not enforce because they didn't agree with it. And so he sued them and lost at the circuit court. He appealed it to the appellate and lost two to three. Supreme Court. Yeah. To the, yes, Supreme Court, excuse me, the Hawaii mm -hmm. Supreme Court. Yeah. So and why, why he lost was because it was preempted, which means that the state has laws already regulating cannabis, therefore the county doesn't have that authority. So by giving the counties that authority, then we would be able to pass another initiative and actually have it work. Brent? Some of us live in you know, food deserts. Some of us live in really economically <coughs> depressed areas. And I like to know how a small family farmer that's been healing their neighbors for the last 30 years can participate moving forward. OK, so that was my working group, was to try to get more um, licenses. And I see Richard Hall was is in here, who is part of my working group. We went as far as what we voted on on the bigger working group was we are going to submit a request to the state legislature to form another working group to see whether or not we could have this licenses other than just dispensaries. So I'm for production licenses. I like the idea of supporting local farmers. But like let, let's... plants per yeah. small farm kind of thing? Or? I, I don't know yet. That's no, what the no, working group No details do. yet, but yes, yeah. I mean, There's we want to go from vertical system. to horizontal, right? Yeah. Okay. We currently have a vertical system. Eventually, we want to go horizontal. And, and the first place to begin is with the growers and with manufacturers such as edibles or drinks or whatever the case may be. Oils and, yeah. but, uh, So, like she said, a working group to look into this and possibly see something pass by 2019. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we'll take your question, and then I want to give um, Will a chance to talk about what he's been working on, and then we'll take more questions. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Auntie. The caveat with all of that is that given the uh, stringent mold checks that are now in place in the legislature, I predict that almost anything grown in Hawaii is going to have mold to some degree. It's going to be very, for a home farmer, to not have any traces of mold whatsoever is going to be difficult for them. So that's just a caveat that I wanted to throw in there that could Thank possibly put a kink in it all. I don't expect it to happen, but it would be wonderful if we could make progress on the caregiver provisions that allows for cannabis co-ops. Uh, I think that is a logical and, and safe and reasonable alternative. People who don't have the money or choose to do the dispensary system. I don't think there's a, a lot of political appetite for that because people want to support the dispensaries strongly and people really want to quash any growth in home growing. I don't agree with that, but that's, I think, the way we'll have to allow that to happen. Um, and meanwhile, I frequently advise people to stay in the black market when it comes to talking about medical marijuana. I still feel that way. And if I, if I wanted to experiment with a co-op of, of you know, community grow, I would keep it under the radar. I think it's safer that way. I, I'm shocked to have to say this, but it's true. Thank you for your honesty. And um, yeah, I mean, we're looking, we're at the ground level, as low as we can be. Of a, if this is the street, the ground, the industry is going to be this high. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are the pioneers. These are the people that are in the trenches. You know, whether it's been you know the '80s, the '90s, whatever, and we've come full circle you know, from legalization for the last thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years in the world, and then a bunch of um, American industrialists, purely for greed, decided to ban it, <laughs> tax it to ban it, and that was just in what 1930s, 40s, and now we're just coming back full circle with the states. So Hawaii is going to, I believe, have to look at this, especially from a revenue resource.
Because at the end of the day, I, this is my 26th year in government, you know, state and county combined. And, and government's not cheap. <laughs> we have to pay for it. So how do we pay for it? We have to take care of ourselves, right? We can't expect Washington or the Japanese tourists. We have to take care of ourselves. So we're either going to take your general excise tax, your income tax, your property tax. Those are your main ones, your business taxes. Or we find another revenue source, and that's where I'm hoping that cannabis will be a part of that discussion on the next revenue source, where we could you know, hopefully build a $100, $200 million industry in Hawaii. And, and you know, dispensaries are a year behind schedule. They're up and running. Hopefully by next year we'll have the vast majority of them. Only three are selling now, but we have up to 16 possibly going to be up. Once we see that this is working and that society is not freaking out, <laughs> everything is okay, people are living good lives, you know, the acceptance level of legalization adult use is going to grow and grow and grow because the train is started and it's not going to stop and California is going to lead the way and all the money that's going to, there's going to be too much money involved not to get involved. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we, and that's why we need people in government that are supportive of this. Because you know? mm -hmm. I, I foresee, you know, um, cannabis tourism in the future, cannabis resorts. Mm -hmm. Imagine catering to <coughs> medical cannabis patients throughout the world. Oh, Hawaii is the best place. They'll okay. take care of you. Mm -hmm. Medical resorts based around medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we get to that local grower on their strains and their products. And that's how we get everybody involved. And, and I, the, the rep mentioned a lot of bills. One bill I'd like to share, um, I want to see the University of Hawaii Medical School partner with the Department of Health. And on a voluntary basis, all 19,000 patients have the option on a voluntary basis to give all their information and data regarding the usage of them. Because no one's collecting this right now, right? Yeah. And I, there's no reason why Hawaii shouldn't be the leader, the international leader in research and development. We all know what Israel is to cannabis, right? Well, let's make Hawaii the new Israel, times 10. The Hawaii brand, now we're just talking the Hawaii brand and marketing. Mm -hmm. And we've got one of the strongest, best brands and names in the world. Mm -hmm. And who wouldn't want to come here to partake in that? And we pass the laws and the policies to take care of them, you know. Mm -hmm. That's where the Ubers and Lyfters mm -hmm. out there, you're going to make money because we're going to make sure these guys aren't driving. Mm -hmm. They're going to be taken care of. Someone's going to be on them. Yeah. And all these other services and um, ways to help that patient because we need to enhance tourism. Tourism is our number one industry, and it will always be our number one industry. We're too far away to do any huge manufacturing types. That's the mainland. But our location rivals any in the world, as you know. And with that, I think I've spoken too much. But police reform, prison reform I'm working on, uh, building an aerospace industry, and I'm the chairman of housing. Housing is our number one issue. Government needs to get more involved in housing, because the only way we're going to build affordable housing is to subsidize it. Affordable rentals are subsidized by government. Private sector does not subsidize them. We must subsidize if you want to bring that. At least, and it, you know, all the islands have that problem. Homelessness. Thank you, Will. Yeah, um, I was just reading here uh, the Department of Revenue for the state of Colorado just said that they um, plan on um, the cannabis industry is going to bring in $1.3 billion this year. And in the last, since 2014, it was over $4.6 billion. And that's just the legal money. And that doesn't even include all the other side benefits of it. It just doesn't seem right that the state of Hawaii has not even gotten one penny of the money that's coming into this this opportunity that's out there. And I don't know what the problem is because we're supposedly a very progressive state and that we should be really, you know, embracing this opportunity. 
And is it education? You think that it's the legislators need to be educated as to what they're missing out here and what's really happening? No, they know the money. The people who like who track this legislation can actually point to the <laughs> to the very conservative legislators, and they're usually in my in my chamber rather than the Senate. Um, that's why the fact that I was able to pass the the, the criminalization the criminalization on drug paraphernalia, which was a House bill, which was my bill, was to me miraculous. But there is, because the State House has, um, has representatives in portions of districts where there is high conservative, you know, like Kaneohe, Marine Corps Base, um, Kahala, or, and a lot of very Christian areas. Mm -hmm there is enough of them that they will try to stop those things. Um, we are looking, like they, to me, the fact that if we could pass a working group to show at least some production licenses, maybe we can, we can loosen the strings more. We, we know that there's money to be made, believe me. We know that there's money to be made. But we're also concerned, we really are concerned about Jeff Sessions. We have seen um, and I know Will and, Will and I have gone to other states like Colorado, and we know that DEA has closed a couple of dispensaries in Colorado because they didn't track as much. Washington is was better. I don't know of any that's being closed. Nevada, they're looking at, um, DEA is looking at very closely because they're they don't have the tracking down right. There is too much what we call diversion into the black market and so is California. So we're, look, we're, we're looking at them as canaries, mm -hmm. okay, because we don't want whatever it is that we do pass to be shut down by Jeff Sessions. And I hate to say it, it's the federal administration, okay. If we go towards like the coal memorandum and go, go forward, then it's a lot easier to get the people who are conservative to jump on the bandwagon. Is there a possibility that Big Island could be the canary for the state? Uh, you know, that's why I, I agree with Russ Ruderman. <laughs> can be made, and then maybe they'll get on board with yeah. Oahu and Maui. So I will take this opportunity to ask everybody here to help support my proposal to let that happen, yeah. because uh, it has not gotten any traction so far. And we'd have to make noise, and the kind of noise we'd have to make includes noise in other people's districts, like the conservative districts on Oahu that Joe was just talking about. They need to hear from some of their constituents, hey, go ahead and let the Big Island do that. I mean, why stand in the way? They need to know there has to be a statewide voice saying that this should happen. And maybe it's finally time. You know, we, we, talk, about, um, we talk about waiting to see what's going to happen. I had the pleasure of being in Colorado this summer. I took a rare vacation and decided I was only going to go to a blue state where cannabis is legal. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to Colorado. And it was an eye-opening experience for me in several ways, one of which I, I got to visit uh, one, of the, one of the growers and movers and shakers there, and she let me look at her field. We went and I looked at her field. Here's a field of corn. Here's a field of cannabis no big fence. It was just kind of no big deal. And, uh, and she said, this is 25 acres. She pointed to it and said, that's a million dollars worth of hemp here. It wasn't even marijuana. It was CBD hemp. That's a million dollars worth of hemp. I've done a little arithmetic. That's like uh, $25,000 an acre, I think, if I got that right, or maybe it's 50. We could use some crops like that, <laughs> you know. But also, I don't understand, forgive me, Joe, I'm not arguing with you, because I, but I don't understand someone saying we have to wait and see what's going to happen. But yes, I understand the fear of Jeff Sessions, but I also understand many other states aren't timid and seem to have blazed the trail already. Colorado's gotten, is getting about a mil, $100 million in tax revenue this year from, from cannabis. That's just tax revenue. And you, somebody mentioned the billion dollars in economic in sales. Well, think of all the jobs that that's created along the way. Mm -hmm. But there's some other things to consider. Everyone's wringing their hands of the opioid epidemic, right? Mm -hmm. I just went to an informational <coughs> briefing at the Capitol where they had this multi-point plan for opioid epidemic. And no one mentioned legalizing cannabis. <laughs> or and, it's, and several states have seen a 25% reduction already mm -hmm. in opioid deaths who have legalized marijuana. 
Uh, really? Are we being cautious by waiting? Really? And we're going to have this multi-point plan. However, we're going to address opioids in Hawaii, but we're not going to do the number one thing that we could do next year that would, that would address the situation. We're not going to do that because we're timid and we've got to wait and see what happens. But what happens already happened. And you talk about the tourism of Colorado and now Cal California is going through recreational marijuana. If we want to get a chunk of that tourism pie, we better hurry up because we're late to the table. You know, and Hawaii should be the tourism capital, but we're not in this regard. And that's just one other reason. We want to keep tourism vibrant. Maybe we want to keep the opioid epidemic down. Maybe we want to not be broke at our state government all the time. These are, these are some big reasons. The idea that, and what happens is when you bring it up, everybody just snickers. Oh, we're legalizing cannabis. Yeah, that's a hippie thing or something like that. It's like, no, it's an idea whose time has come and has passed. And it's ridiculous to stand in the way of it now. Forgive me my soapbox, but if I agree, these folks on Oahu who feel this way, can they just let us have our freedom, like yeah. a dozen other states have done, and then we can show whether it works or not? Can we experiment? Can you please let us do what we want? And so I, I think that's a logical argument. I hope I'll have all of your support very vocally on that. <laughs> Chairs, if you want to fill in the chairs, anybody in front? I see some I'll people. Sit there. Okay. Oh, <laughs> but um, oh, wait, excuse me. Sorry, I'm checking one question. Okay, yeah, um, I'm currently under indictment for having a collective, and I was talking to Mr. Damerville, who is, I should say, the wisest prosecutor here on the Big Island, and we were sitting out front, and uh, I told him about Act 178, where they removed the restriction between patient and caregiver, and we thought that meant patients could trade. Apparently I was wrong. <coughs> Three lives plus 32 years. Anyway, so we're out front, and this is back when me and him were still friends. And, and what he said was, and I think he's got an excellent point, and that's why I'm bringing it up, because we have respirosity, I believe, kicking in this year, right? 2018? Well, we, we have to. Uh is that true? The laws are made, but we're going to have a bill in that's going to push for reciprocity oh, okay. by summer of next year. Oh, okay. If, if, we, if we could pass this bill. So now you're going to have medical patients from around the country, hopefully, mm -hmm. coming to visit our state and looking to get marijuana. And so, what, Mr. Danerbo, because when I asked him, I said, what makes you think I'm guilty of anything? Because, you know, he's seen all the records collective. We were running totally up front and had accountants and everything paying taxes. He said, Mike, it's the affirmative defense is what makes you guilty. And what the affirmative defense is, is this was a promulgated rule by the Attorney General. See, once they passed the law, Act 228, back in the year 2000, it was, it, it was the public safety that came up with how to implement it. And even though Act 228 was mirrored word for word with California's, what they did is they wait until, and I hope you guys can work on this as well, is closing this loophole. Because what they do is they wait until the legislation adjourns, and then they submit their promulgated rules, as you know, and then the governor signs it. And so now what you have is law enforcement writing law. And that's how you come up with the affirmative defense. And let me explain what the affirmative defense does. The affirmative defense, once, is your only protection as a medical patient, and what it does is it takes burden of proof, which is in America you're innocent until proven guilty. The affirmative defense switches that. Now you're guilty till proven innocent. And if on top of that, if that's not just, that's just one punch, then they kick you below the belt. Because once the judge rules that you were out of compliance, you can't even bring up the fact you had a medical license. And so, I agree with um, I, I agree with Ricky Roy that um, when it when something is called an affirmative defense, the burden then shifts to the defendant to prove. Okay, so I have to look at that. But I also agree with you, which we are very unhappy with in the legislature. And this time, it's with the Department of Health when we gave them the rulemaking responsibility for this new dispensary, that they ended up coloring the rules against our initial intent. So now we keep trying to fix it. I, I don't know what your, the specifics is in your case, but I will definitely look at it. And I'm sure I'm going to get 
the senator's support to see whether or not there's any kind of bill we can to help you out on that. Okay, but you gotta let you gotta let me know. Um, originally, I thought about legalizing co-ops, and Jen knows I was trying to push for that, but. That had strong headwinds, but maybe this sounds like an easier fit. So affirmative defense means <coughs> that if you are raided by the police and you have a medical marijuana card, say you just harvested and your, your medicine is hanging and it's drying, as soon as it's cut, the police will see that drying medicine and they will weigh it. And if it's over your allowed three to four ounces, now it's four ounces, then they will say that you have violated your terms of the affirmative defense. Therefore, you do not get to bring up in court that you were a medical marijuana patient. Does that make sense? So, <laughs> yeah, let, us, let, me, let me look at it. Have your, have your yeah, it I think the state law would be able to fix that. Yeah, so I would li like, what, are, what is your perspective on that? Is yeah, there anything I think we would all now? be supportive if we could work on the language. Yeah. But that wasn't my understanding. But I want to I want to see more of it. Okay, I mean we are yeah. we are. It was Rick. I thought I'd just share his knowledge because he's a very knowledgeable prosecutor. Yes, he is. And I think he cut right to the heart of the matter. Well, that yeah. Affirmative defense is just wrong. It needs to be removed. But affirmative defense is not only for that. It's for other other crimes too. But so we, it cannot be a blanket. But we, let, I want to do one specifically for your case. Because currently it seems like you have well, that doesn't make sense. Well, yeah. So let's go look at it. 2018, the department might issue a new license. Um, but that hasn't been decided, and they have the option not to. Okay. So odds are there will not be any um, applications for next year. Because we need to see the, uh, the 16 up and running. That's the main thing. Right. And in our decision making, economics should play a minor role to whether or not the decision we're making is helping a patient. And once we can take care of those that rely on cannabis medicine first, then, then let's, let's sort it out. But right now, we have a dispensary system that does not have a requirement to grow the medicine for the only approved conditions that patients are allowed to have. So there is no medical program, so to speak. What we're talking about is more of a retail program. Now, we will see dispensaries grow operations, home market operations grow the strains that patients need most in the terpenoid profiles, etc. Every decision that we make when we're talking about a small child that's relying on cannabis medicine needs to be in that context exactly. And if we cannot take care of that person first, we really should not be regulating this safe and effective medicine, in my opinion. This is new. This is uncharted territory. That's why some of it is cautious and or conservative. Um, but the industry, the advocates, you folks need to help educate us too as well. And hopefully uh, as the industry grows, as the patient base grows, the lobbying and the advocacy will continue, get better, get stronger, become more focused. And, and just like any new industry that comes along. Okay. By 2020, this is going to be a $20 billion industry worldwide. And the question is, what piece is Hawaii going to get? So we, that has to be impressed a lot to our lawmakers. I want to uh, just ask one question here um, regarding Act 178, um, the medical marijuana law. Last legislative, two legislative sessions ago, the definition, the distribution was amended and it was amended to change the definition of distribution from between patient and caregiver to patient to patient. So I was hoping that one of you could comment on what the intent of that was if you know what it what it was. Wait, we passed that or we didn't pass it? We did pass it. Patient to patient. Yes, it changed from it took out the stri the restriction between patient and caregiver and completely. Mm -hmm. So it's not considered distribution as far as commercial promotion of marijuana. Um, right. You need so to show us exactly what it's that. In the, it's in 712, defensive promotion, 
and uh, basically promoting a detrimental drug. Three, three, two, nine, one, two, one. What? Uh, there, there Sixteen or seventeen? What year oh, we passed that? Sure. Um, that was before me. Right. Well, I think it was two thousand. Not monetary. Sixteen. Fourteen. Sixteen. Thirteen. Two thousand thirteen. Okay. Thirteen took effect in twenty two. That's right. Took effect in twenty fifteen. Okay, that was before yeah, me. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with I that. I don't know what was the intent of that. I really don't. Can't answer it. Okay. Yeah. I don't, has it impacted anybody in a negative yeah. way? Yes, it has. It yeah. would. Yeah. yeah. So, then, local, local so police. Um, uh, say that distribution among patients can happen among four patients per TMK. Five licenses per TMK, but that only leaves you with four. So they're looking at it from a, a number perspective. A, a very small number. number. Right, but that, I mean, that's patients, the issue. Patients believe that we can trade amongst ourselves. Yeah, and that's something if we really wanted to fix that, if we had the votes, we could do it. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I've had people ask me, can we... You know, pass a law that would allow dispensaries to give away Found. cannabis free. No, free, especially to the very poor, you know, the, uh, the underprivileged children and others. Just give it away for free and or allow patients to give it away. But some of these things, there are legislative fixes if we're able, and if you have ideas on bills, now is the time to give us ideas on bills. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead. Happy that the state will get some money because obviously it needs money. However, if you look at what happened in California, it went from like 15% to 45%. They're charging the production companies this huge amount of, of uh, taxation, and that's going to be passed down to the consumer. And that, as he was talking about with patients, there's a lot of people on the, especially this side of the island, they don't have the, that kind of money to have go in there and buy, you know, $500 ounce wheat, you know, weed or something like that because of the restrictions that are paid placed by the taxation that the states like. I mean, I don't want to say greedy, but everybody gets real greedy with this $20 billion thing, right? Everybody, not everybody, there's some people. That yeah, but right now, we're not, we don't have a tax on the medical cannabis right now. Okay? Right. They're not paying. So, and the idea, the intent, if we ever do get to adult use, that uh, patients will not get any 15, 20, 25% tax. That's that would be purely for adult use recreational. Well, this is the kind of thing that you have to watch out for. Well, we're not even there, though. We're not yeah. even close. Okay. Okay. I mean, uh, my opinion, you're okay. looking at four to five years minimum. And, and, yeah. and I agree with you. I see that both of our Big Island dispensaries are um, represented this out here. I see Richard Hara and I see, um, I forgot your name, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah Kea yeah. from La Ola is, is, is Hawaiian ethos. Hawaiian ethos and La Ola is here, sorry. So um, you can talk to them as far as the stars. But when that was also one of the reasons why the why the bill also died was because uh, the Senate chair was insistent on one of a pretty damn big <coughs> GE tax for, okay? And one of the reasons we wanna make sure that um, the dispensaries have an ability to be able to compete with the black market. And if we require them to have that tax, people are not gonna go to the dispensaries. They're just gonna go to the black market. So mm -hmm. we are cognizant of that, but we're hoping that even with just the 4% here in the Big Island, we would be able to, um, if we could get people to be legalized, not necessarily to be legalized, that we could get some of that 4% increase by just having more product, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I was just gonna address that, uh, Natek. You know, I, it, would, it would be nice if we didn't want to tax it, but, and this goes to what Brent was saying. Also, I mean, it, when it comes to legislators and government officials, they think about, you know, fundraising opportunities, you know. And that's going to be one of the motivations for folks who don't naturally think this should be legal to want to do it. So I think there's a place for that. The, the caution should be it shouldn't be exorbitant. And uh, the other caution should be don't ever let them take away your right to grow it yourself because then you have the choice. And then if you're not someone who grows it yourself, you go pay the retail price and you pay the tax. But you always have that choice to grow this plant yourself and not worry about the cost of the store. And, and that's going to be something to watch for at every step along the way. I mean, the really big players in this really don't want you growing your own, you know? Right. Forget about the medium players that are in this state. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to have to be vigilant about protecting that freedom. And I think that's the answer to a lot of taxation too. And, and Russell is correct about that. That's the reason why I was insistent on being in the conference committee was because our district has a lot of grow your own. And that was one of the 
big pushes I had was to ensure that we are able to grow our own. And in fact, this session we increased, right, from seven to 10. So Thank we'll see. Thank you. Yeah. Stop using the word marijuana. Stop yeah. using the word weed. It's cannabis. Yeah. And um, Harvard just had its first MedCan conference, and it had some really powerful people, some from Israel, some from you know, around the world. Specifically about medical cannabis, you know, you have objections. You have objections for a reason because people have lack of knowing what they need to know. And I think if, all, like, you're really good, you know, using the word cannabis and the others aren't necessarily. We've got to get past that because that's the block number one. Um, there's some powerful training that has just played in the past two months. I'll be happy to, you know, send some in your direction. But there's some, we've really got to under, better understand the medicinal part of cannabis because even, I was just an Oregon, I was just in Washington, I went to some dispensaries. Even they don't know it. And California, there's a place called Miriam's Hope that they're inundated with requests. And on their website, they list all the different um, ailments and the percent of, you know, terpenes, THC, CBD. And those are the things I think that will really help move us forward. Did you That's have a question? My comment. No, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's, it's obvious that we're putting roadblocks in front of us ourselves because of things we, you know, you're so passionate and it's wonderful. I think it's really understanding what the objections are, where they're coming from, and how we, where do we need to shift to be able to move around those objections. Sometimes things, though, at the Capitol are not logical. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, one of the bills that passed last year changed all references of marijuana and state law to cannabis. Yeah, so that yeah, was a development. But uh, I'm not convinced that that's our problem. But I mean, I'm happy to move forward with it, but I don't think that's the problem here. Uh, and I request, before we finish, just to have a minute to talk about one Sure, thing. yeah. Um, Brian? Yeah, I, excuse me, um, I did pick up on a little bit when you were saying, like, patients' rights as opposed, like, you know, concerning landlords and employers. We're looking now, at it. Now, you know, the whole thing in tourism is a beautiful, rosy picture, but if you look in the one ads, you'll see like $500 bonuses for line cooks, you know, and stuff like this. And the thing is, is, you know, the hotels, they do drug testing. And not only that, that they do, you know, spot testing. And I have a good friend who's now retired, worked for the Fairmont Orchid for like over nine years. You know, during the course of that time, he had like four different employee of the months. He picked up overtime. He was like star employee. He worked for me catering. I used to nickname him the human Cuisinart, you know. I mean, just incredible person and everything else, but he smoked, okay? Five years, he carried around the fake pee with him in his uniform in case he got pulled aside. And after, like, year number six, it's like, you know, screw this. Well, like you, you know, and You know what I'm getting at? And then, and then towards the end, they, they did a random thing. He got pulled, and he lost his job, you know? And, I mean, that's unfair. You know, it's not, but that's the insurance companies calling the shots and everything else. And I understand that, but is there a way to combat that? Well, again, the, the industry is going through a pivot, okay? We're, right. we're going through this major pivot uh, culturally, nationally, you know, attitudes, morals, values. It's changing. And we all know it's now becoming more readily accepted. Even the poll that was recently in Civil Beat, for those of you that may have seen it, if you take that poll against polls just a couple years ago by the Drug Policy Forum, their numbers were in 58 to 60 and 66 percent that people, the majority, supported um, legalizing cannabis if we were going to tax it and use that as a revenue generator. Uh, the most recent poll was 66 percent. The poll that was just in the Civil Beat just a couple <coughs> days ago was just a straight out, should we legalize marijuana? And it was a 55 percent no. Should we legalize marijuana? 55% just said no. But when you qualify it with the other part, I think people are supportive. And in that last one, it was clearly a generational issue. 50, uh, 50 years old and over, majority no. 50 and under, the majority yes. So, so things are changing, and, and we just need lawmakers and elected officials who understand this, just like, you know, look, I mean, you know, same-sex marriage, took years, death with dignity, we're not even there yet. You know, medical cannabis, it's taken a good 10 to 15 years to get to this point. Some laws, unfortunately, and legislation takes that time, but we're now at a very crucial point. 
and we need Richard and all the other dispensaries to be successful. Mm -hmm. And we need them to be able to provide a good quality <coughs> product and the patients to be happy and helpful and that's going to help us move this along. And hopefully, sooner than later, we can do decriminalization. The Senate has passed over bills to decriminalize to the House, the House, as we all know, has balked or been the conservative group. But I do believe that things could be changing. The, the House is getting much younger now, actually. <laughs> More well, progressive, my, hopefully. Yeah. I think my question is, though, on the insurance companies are calling the shots. We're looking so at a task force. Yeah. Okay, one of the recommendations from our legislative oversight that we just had last mm -hmm. week was to create another task force to look at purely the insurance side, to look at um, and get the insurance companies and everyone involved to, to see what's it going to take to get an insurance reimbursement. That was, uh, that's one of the um, suggestions from the Legislative Oversight Committee. Okay. Uh, and looking at insurance. Uh, we're even looking at uh, removing, um, there was talk about the, removing the prohibition on um, patients inter and transportation right. that was mentioned and, and even brought up about just smoking at home. Some people would like to think, well, uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, using outside of the home, using outside, excluding smoking. So if you wanted to use, you know, eat a, a cookie, a gummy bear, have a, a drink uh, in a park on the sidewalk, that would be okay. So we're looking at, at that in terms of a, a definition. Um, and, you know, I want, I want us to do edibles by 2020. Right now, I, I haven't gotten... Some, some good feedback on, on putting a specific <coughs> date. But hopefully uh, you might see something to, to look at, okay, what's it going to take to get edibles up and running? Because, you, you know, you're going to have the Department of Health side, you're going to have the dosage, and, and, and get that group of stakeholders. So maybe sooner versus later we could pass something on um, edibles. And, and then the opioid um, alternative or substance abuse disorder would be another ailment. Um, we were talking about opioid right. use uh, as well. I, I could stay, but I, my flight's at 4.30, so <laughs> I just... I should be the 10 minutes. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I guess one more question. Oh. And Please. Please. Two, Two. How, how many more? Three yeah. more? It looks like we who have who, have has, not asked, who, yeah. who has not asked the question? Raise your hand if you want to ask. One. Two, two three. three. Is, all right, okay, okay. Those, that's one, two, three. All right, why don't we do that? Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, what happens, I guess, to people, for example, the decriminalizing of drug trafficking, <coughs> to the people that have um, been convicted under more conservative law? So, so talk to those attorneys for the people who have been convicted to see whether or not they can get it expunged. Yeah, it can be done okay. for the people who have been prior conviction. It might be nice if there is like a Eventually, uh, clear process for people, I don't know, just an uh, agency or something that did help people who maybe only had Or just a blanket part in your state, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, right. Included right. in the bill. Included in the bill. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, we didn't, maybe we, we didn't can do a bill on that. Maybe we can do a bill. Yeah. That's the right question. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. That is a good question. Yeah. Um, uh, only about 15% of the medical schools in the country teaches about the endocannabinoid system. And you know, since I got my uh, medical card, I started looking into it, and it looks to me like it's kind of the, the scientific basis for cannabis. So I'm wondering, how can we um, encourage our uh, medical school, you know, whether it be the uh, pharmacy school or, or the Jackson, <clears throat> how can we encourage them to, to lead the country? Because you, you, we have an opportunity, like you guys said, to, to lead the country. And overriding everything is what happened with sugar and pine. It lasted for about 100 years, yeah? Then it basically got commoditized, and then you can get it cheaper every place else, then now all of a sudden our sugar and pine is gone. <clears throat> so in the case of uh, cannabis, it's going to be happening much, much faster. Within 10 years, it, it's going to change. And an example was I just went to the LA um, uh, conference at, at, uh, at not LA, but Las Vegas conference. And it went from 8,000 participants last year to 18,000 this year. It's not going to double, 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 double forever. I, I think we're lucky if we got five years. So, so, so the question is, how do we 
uh, how do we brand ourselves? And we know Aloha Spirit is, is you know, what uh, we're all about, you yeah? So how can we, uh, you know, even, even if you do um, a la'au la 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 kind of stuff and, and mix <coughs> things together, let, let's kind of make sure that if, if it can't be soy from Mexico and call it Hawaiian. It's got to be. Yeah, we will put in eventually the protections that need to be done to protect our industry, to protect our brand, to protect Hawaii as lawmakers. Once we get to that point, but we got to, like I said, you got to convince, you have to have the right people in the legislature, mm -hmm. you have to have the right people higher mm -hmm. up. And, yeah. and, and that's how you Who get things so done, hard. you know. And we know, yeah. we all, everybody here, know the positive benefits. And we all see it. And, and it is coming. This is a tsunami wave that is not stopping. The question is just, how quickly is Hawaii going to join in on this? We were the first state in 2000 to pass medical cannabis. The first state. And then we waited 15 years. OK, so I'm trying to impress upon my colleagues. We can't wait anymore. This is important. You want to build a new university here. You want to build a new highway here. You want to take care of the elderly. You want to protect the environment. You want to do better in law enforcement. You want to do this and that. Well, show us the money. Show us the money. Or else we're going to tax you. Yeah, if I could briefly add that, Richard. I, I hope that our university and medical schools will also step up to this opportunity. You know, right now, I, I assume they're both very concerned about federal prohibitions, yes. and that's why other countries are going farther. But some, there's been some research done in this, in this country. Yeah, because they don't have to touch it. They can teach it. Well, I mean, to, get, to me, to get the university and medical school to take this more seriously would require advocacy from people like you, who mm -hmm. can see clearly the economic future of it, as well as the medical future of it. Not just folks like me and Puna saying do it. You know, we need everybody else telling them to do it. <laughs> I, I don't understand why they don't see this opportunity, but I think public pressure might help them be a little bit more bold about it. Were you at that conference at UH about a month ago? Absolutely. Yeah, we were there. So UH has already taken a, a couple of baby steps. 20, 20, 20 minutes out of four hours. They right, but, it, but they've it. taken baby steps. But I'm getting, I didn't finish my bill. The bill that would allow the patients to voluntarily share information, I've spoken to the president about it, uh, um, Lassner. I talked to the dean of the medical school, and they're willing to take that as long as we could give them some funding to it, uh, where they'll collect the data, do what they do, and again, they're not touching flowers. They're willing to do that. So everyone's on board. It's just a matter of how quickly we're going to get this train moving. But everybody's on board. We're making progress, as you know. And, and it's just not soon enough for all of us in this room. Yeah, okay. That's really what it Let's is. Let's move on. Go ahead. The reason that medical cannabis status for patients isn't protected under HIPAA, is that a matter of conflicting state versus federal regulations? And the Schedule One thing. Yeah. yeah. So this HIPAA just doesn't apply. Yeah. Well, HIPAA is between a, a doctor and the patient, right? I don't know that HIPAA comes into play when you have a medical license and go into a dispensary. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure that's even covering that. But within, like, but you applying to the doctor for certification, HIPAA does apply to that. Mm -hmm. It's when you use that medical certification to, to as a defense when a cop stops you, then HIPAA doesn't apply to that because yeah. Russell is right. It's between you and your doctor. Well, I think it's more than that. There are centralized databases that have everybody's name on them. But it, it's helped. It doesn't, even, it doesn't even require you being arrested in order for law enforcement to look at those lists. We have a long history, not only, we have a strong history in this state of criminalizing medical marijuana patients. And we thought that moving the whole program to the Department of Health a few years ago was going to make that go away. It hasn't really made it go away. It's one of the big issues that we remain to fight, and that's why I constantly advise my constituents to stay on the black market, because I believe they have made it very dangerous to be a medical marijuana patient. And I applaud the people who are bold enough to go forward, but I advise my friends to not do it. And I think it's a tragic situation. It's, it's absolutely backwards. 
Jennifer, can I mention a couple of, I just, I, I just, just one request of everybody before we close. Sure, yeah, and then, yeah, go ahead and I'll, I'll close it. Okay. If you guys would all like to say a closing statement. Oh, thank you. This will be, can be mine. You know, we talked earlier about the uh, Citizens Initiative, a process by which you can put a, a question on the ballot and vote for it. And that's how uh, cannabis has been legalized in most of the states where it has happened, actually. That's how things like $15 an hour have been passed. Um, so that is one bill that we'll put forward next year. And with a, if a miracle happens, maybe it'll go through. But most legislators don't want any kind of opportunity for big change. There will be great resistance to this. So what I want to mention is that once every 10 years, and I, next year is the year, there's going to be a question on your ballot, should we have a constitutional convention? Many people are very afraid of constitutional conventions. We don't know what's going to happen. It's a Pandora's box kind of thing. We haven't had one in 40-something years. I hope that there'll be a big move next year to get people to vote, yes, let's have a constitutional convention. Because at such a convention, we could establish citizens' initiative without the legislature being able to block it. It's a path forward for we, the people, to create the laws that we want. So there's, there's two ways to try to get an initiative passed next year. One's a bill and one's a constitutional convention, which I think is worth the risk of having for the many ways that we need to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I hope you'll support both of those efforts. And I want to thank everybody that put on the event, Brent and Jen, everybody else. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. As both senators have pointed out, there. You know, when we are in the state capital, you folks aren't there because you folks are in the neighbor islands. And the people who have the monies to show up at the state capital, I hate to say it, have their voices heard a heck of a lot louder than the rest of you folks. I mean, we have only two Puna legislators here, and we do our best versus the 51 in the state house, 25 in the Senate. That we need, as you know, that we need to voice our concerns with. One of the things that um, Senator Sparrow has pointed out was basically that even though the Department of Health has the opportunity in, in 2018 to open up dispensary applications again, you know, there is a big push not to do that because, like, our two dispensaries here aren't up and running. If you folks are interested, I really want you folks to have your voices heard to say that, you know, I. I love you folks to death for trying and looking at the two dispensaries here, but maybe we should give other people a chance to actually go up and running because, and uh, maybe it's time to open it up again. So if you folks want that to happen, you <coughs> folks need to email, and when the time comes, I will let you folks know who to, how to get your voices heard. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Yeah. Hello. Well, be here a little more if you guys want to talk. And, and I, so let me mention one thing. One more item we're looking at passing is employment law uh, that will protect a medical uh, cannabis patient uh, that is drug test, who was drug tested, and they're going to be found with um, cannabis in their system. That uh, that alone is not grounds for termination. So we're, we're going to, yeah, we're going to try to pass something to that effect. Um, obviously, if there's other cause, sure, but in yeah. terms of just the patient taking a drug test, being found positive, you know, uh, that, again, that's, that that's the, um, makes no sense to do that. Um, but yeah, happy to talk and share. Um, like so, a lot of us are frustrated, but we are, every year, you know, we passed the bill um, 2015, 2016, 2017. We're going to pass another bill and more bills 2018. So um, this does have the attention of the legislators. And one of these days, we're going to get back to a, to, to a point where um, it's going to be um, just normal, normalized. Thank you. And I just want to say, as a legislator myself, I know how difficult it can be in going up against a mentality that is not familiar <laughs> to us. And um, just really applaud you and your efforts. First of all, I know you didn't have to be here, so thank you for coming. And second of all, thank you. Thank you for stepping up and being a voice for our island and being bold in facing that 
really kind of reefer madness mentality <laughs> that has overcome the conservative um, majority of our legislature at the state level. I know we're fighting an uphill battle and all of the work that you're doing is critically important. But also what you're working on with, for getting the counties the ability to regulate ourselves and also have the state initiative. Joy, for, for decriminalizing the, the paraphernalia and for trying okay. to, to legalize small amounts of cannabis. And what you just said, well, these, all of these are all small steps that we need, but have a world of difference on impacting the safety and the quality of life of our, our island residents. Okay. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.